We're back again for the final time, maybe possibly. Good morning, everybody. It's Midnight and Beyond. Welcome to a very interesting title screen. Welcome back to the world of Undertale, which is hopefully going to be the last time we are here. Not hopefully as in I'm sick of this game, but <laughs> hopefully as in when the fruit am I done with this stinking game? This is the final bonus episode, the bonus episode to end all bonus episodes where I go over everything I missed. Sort of everything. Of course there's like a million different dialogue options I probably could have seen or whatever. A lot of little secret characters or whatever. I know that the Nintendo Switch version that just got released has a special secret boss that's exclusive to it. I might show it in the future if I buy the Switch version but that will be a bonus video for another day. And we'll continue the trend of just this game never ending. But I will go ahead and just do the big things that we have not been able to do up to this point. And that is some certain things involving keys and doors. That's what this is going to be all about. After that, however, this LP will be finished. Sort of. And I can move on to other things. So we're just going to go ahead and enter the end of the game. After you finished the genocide run uh, and reset the universe and all that jazz, uh, I just went ahead and did another pacifist run, and this time I went ahead without killing anyone! Hooray! So we still have to face judgment by Sans, however, so we're gonna go ahead and do that. You all know the gist of it. Just walk down this ominous gray hallway. Uh, due to the fact that I haven't killed anyone this time around, though, I'm not getting interrupted by a bunch of spirits that are shaming me this time, so it makes it a bit quicker for us to get through here. And yeah, this isn't blind anymore, I do know what I'm supposed to be doing because it's sort of hard to figure out on your own, so at this point onward it's about me trying to inform you. Uh, we'll save again right here. Uh, I guess I could cut away to when we actually get through here just because it's sort of gonna be not pointless, but like- Oh, there are enemies to interrupt us. Okay, I'll cut away to when we get to the holy chambers of shadows and gold and stuff with sands. Thankfully, we don't have to fight him this time around, but I'll just cut away to when we get there. <sighs> Thankfully, we do not have to fight anyone this time around. What you're going to want to do is save your game right here, and then just walk down the hall, which I'm sure you are very well familiar with doing at this point. So you finally made it. The end of your journey is at hand. In a few moments, you will meet the king. Together, you will determine the future of this world. That's then. Now, you will be judged. You will be judged for your every action. You will be judged for every EXP you've earned. What's EXP? It's an acronym. It stands for Execution Points, a way of quantifying the pain you have inflicted on others. When you kill someone, your EXP increases. When you have enough EXP, your love increases. Love, too, is an acronym. It stands for Level of Violence, a way of measuring someone's capacity to hurt. The more you kill, the easier it becomes to distance yourself. The more you distance yourself, the less you will hurt. The more easily you can bring yourself to hurt others. But you... You never gained any love. Of course, that doesn't mean you're completely innocent or naive. Just that you kept a certain tenderness in your heart. No matter the struggles or hardships you faced, you strive to do the right thing. You refuse to hurt anyone. Even when you ran away, you did it with a smile. You never gained love, 
but you gained love. Does that make sense? Maybe not. Now, you're about to face the greatest challenge of your entire journey. Your actions here will determine the fate of the entire world. If you refuse to fight, Asgore will take your soul and destroy humanity. But if you kill Asgore and go home, monsters will remain trapped underground. What will you do? Well, if I were you, I would have thrown in the towel by now. But you didn't get this far by giving up, did you? That's right. You have something called determination. So as long as you hold on, so as long as you do what's in your heart, I believe you can do the right thing. All right. We're all counting on you, kid. Good luck. At this point, you do not advance, you do not go back, you have to turn off the game. And turn it back on. Wait a second. That look on your face while I was talking. You've already heard my spiel, haven't you? I suspected something like this. You're always acting like you know what's going to happen. Like you've seen it all before. So, I have a request for you. I kind of have a secret code word that only I know. So I know if someone tells it to me, they'll have to be a time traveler. Crazy, right? Anyway, here it is. Whisper, whisper. I'm counting on you to come back here and tell me that. See you later. Once you have that code word, reset the game again. Huh? Do you have something to say to me? What? A code word? Can you speak a little louder? Did you... Just say... I'm a stupid doo-doo butt? Wow, I can't believe you would say that. Not only is that completely infantile... But it's also my secret code word. 
That, however, isn't good enough. What you need is the secret secret code word. It's only for people that know the secret code word. Anyway, here it is. Whisper, whisper. I'm counting on you to come back here and tell me that. See you later. You know the drill. Huh? Do you have something to say to me? What? A code word? Can you speak a little louder? Did you? Just say, I'm the legendary fart master? Wow. That's, uh, really childish. Why would you think that was a secret, secret code word? Whoever told you that is a dirty liar. I don't have a secret secret code word. However, I do have a secret secret triple secret code word. Which you just said. So, I guess you're qualified. Here's the key to my room. It's time. You learn the truth. We were never able to enter Sansa's room when we initially entered his and Papyrus' house. It's very apparent at this point that Sans knows so much more than he ever let on. In the beginning, middle, even in the end, he still left us guessing, trying to piece everything together on what everything meant what our role was, and just exactly what we had done. Now that we have this key, it's time to uncover the truth. By the way, in this universe, I went ahead and first said I didn't remember his name, and his response? I'll never forget that you forgot! Thrilling. Do I have a dramatic entrance, or do I... Go with comedy? Dramatic, comedy, dramatic, comedy. I can't resist, I gotta talk to them again. Hey, punk, what's up? At you! Papyrus, how can you stand this cold? I have no skin! So why don't we stand in Grillby's instead? Because I hate grease! But you don't have a stomach! No, but I have standards! Worth it. This game just never makes me stop thinking and pondering. It's so deep and complex while being incredibly silly at the same time. But now it's finally time for all of that to come to an end as we uncover the truth. You unlock the door and enter. Hey, Sans! Have you seen my- Oh, hello! You aren't Sans! Wait a second. Why were you using a treadmill in the dark? 
Zen's breaking you across time and space! I hate it when he does that! How immature can you get? Also, have you seen my action figures? Wait, I know where to look! In my collection! <laughs> Sometimes I'm a genius, all the time! It's a treadmill. There's a message attached. The truth is that you got owned, nerd. Yep. That's it. It's just a joke. Well, we might as well examine everything while we're here. It's Sansa's dirty sock pile. So, scandalous. Or sc scandalous? Uh, nani? It appears to be a self-sustaining tornado made of trash. Uh, sometimes you have a very rare chance of the annoying dog appearing in here, which of course it can. It's a worn mattress. The sheets are bunched up in a weird cr creasy ball. It's an uncovered pillow. It's a thank you letter. It's addressed to Santa. <laughs> Inside the drawer is a silver key. You put it on your keychain. Interesting. Uh, I'll just check real quick. Okay. Uh, this silver key, where does it lead exactly? Is it over here? Hello! That's not my house! That's just my cool tool shed! Do you call it your cool shed? No! I've never thought of that! That's why we're friends, Undyne! You enrich my life with shed-based puns! That's the only one I've ever made, dude! Uh, this tool shed, it can only be accessed if you lose the fight with Papyrus. You get locked up in here, and you're just sort of waiting for Undyne to come pick you up and, uh, take your soul. However, Papyrus leaves very obvious notes and collectibles in there for you to, uh, escape. Because he's your friend and he cares about you. And you can keep on doing the fight over and over again. If you keep on losing, then there's, like, more and more, uh easier ways of getting out of the shed like sometimes you're just like okay i give up at this point just hurry up and get out of here it's really interesting and funny but that is not the key uh that the key that we got does not allow us to go through there instead we got to go a la mario rpg and walk behind a building you unlock the door and entered this on the other hand is quite interesting there's a photo album inside the drawer there are photos of Sans with a lot of people you don't recognize. He looks happy. You look inside the drawer. There's some kind of badge. Blueprints. You can't read the symbols they're written in. Or maybe it's just the handwriting. I don't know if that line specifically was always there in earlier versions of this game. GAME! Looks like they relate to some kind of strange machine. Blueprints. You can't read the symbols they're written in. Or maybe it's just the handwriting. There's a strange machine behind the curtain. It seems to be broken. There is no explanation as to what this room is. It's just here to make you question. There are a couple theories as to what this relates to. I'm gonna get the most famous slash infamous one out of the way, the one posed by Matt Pat of Game Theory. He believes that the badge in question is a Franklin badge. The poorly written blueprints are written by Mr. Saturns in their interesting text language. The machine behind the curtain is a broken face distorter, and the photo album is the one given to you by the photo man at the end of Earthbound. He believes that Sans is Ness. But it's just a theory! Okay, but in all seriousness, in all seriousness, no. Um, I knew of this theory, like I haven't watched it until just now because I didn't want anything spoiled for me, obviously, but... I know after reading some comments, like, it is very, very, uh, disliked, and a lot of people really don't like the theory, but 
That might just be the fact that apparently Undertale has a very toxic community, which of course it does because everything I like nowadays seems to have a toxic community. But, um, I don't know, like, with... I'm not gonna get into like a big old rant about game theory and all that jazz, but I honestly really do like uh, their work and uh, sometimes a lot of their things are hit and miss for me. I'm not really crazy about the theories that are all just like, Mario Kart's drive fast. If you drive fast in real life, you die. If you're a real human driving fast, but it's just a theory. Luigi has money. Coin is big in Mario World. If coin had been given to you in real life, you have a lot of money. Luigi Rich. It's just a theory. I'm not too crazy about those theories, but I love, love, love the theories that are like, actually like about the story of the game and even if it isn't true if it is just like a made-up story like a creepypasta sort of thing there's all somewhat facts that could be tied together and have it all make sense and whatnot i love the uh, rosalina and peach theory i'm not going to spoil it for you if you haven't seen it because i really think it's worth watching it's just such a cool thing and it makes me enjoy super mario galaxy one of my favorite games of all time that much more um i definitely recommend you watch that uh the Majora's Mask Theory is also a really good one. Uh, the Doki Doki Literature Club theories, it's not more so theories, like, it was actually just straight up correct. I think he pieced together what that game series is going to evolve into later on, and uh, in case you didn't know, I actually played through all of Doki Doki Literature Club on Viznomatic with some of the members, and if you want to see a full Let's Play of that on there, uh, you could go ahead and do so if you're into that game or if you just want to see me uh, be part of playing that. Then you could go ahead and see it. Maybe we'll play the sequel, whatever that turns into. Though I doubt Sylvia will allow it, but that's beside the point. We'll get to that when it comes. But as for the Undertale theory, I've heard the jokes over the years of Sans being Ness over and over and over again. I didn't know if it was actually true or not. If there were actually things in this game that would uh, confirm that, or if that's what Toby's vision actually was. I somewhat doubted it because I doubt this game would have been allowed to release on a Nintendo console or on any console really if it had uh, copywritten characters from uh, first party developers that Toby had no uh, relation to. I know that Papyrus is meant to be designed after a Starman, but uh, the design is very, very loosely based on it, so he was able to get away with it. As for the Sans' nest theory, it's up to you whether or not you want to believe it. I personally don't. His final Undertale theories that go into a certain other character, I believe that one to be the more true one, even if Toby never really developed that story or intended for people to really think too deep into it. Hi. I like that one a lot more, and I love those sorts of game theory videos where it's just um, all about piecing things together in which it actually makes sense and having actual facts of within the game and uh, real life science and history and just factual information that even if you don't agree with the theory it still just logically makes sense and it's fun to think about it just makes the game deeper to have these sort of imagina imagination ideas or whatever and at the end of every video, you gotta remember, he says it's just a theory, a game theory. He's not claiming for it to be true or factual. He's not saying that his idea is uh, more canon than anyone else's. It's just for fun. So I saw how much stinking hate was behind all of that, and uh, the story about him giving a copy of Undertale to the Pope. Uh, again, I didn't really look into that until playing the game for myself, and then I went ahead and watched those videos. And I thought it was all really deep and beautiful, because everything that I said about this game, what it represents, what it stands for, and of course everything that you guys know what this game stands for, um, I thought that was just a really beautiful idea and very cool. Of course, he would never actually play the game. I don't know like if he could have uh, recorded a certain Let's Play or his own gameplay and uh, shown the video to the Pope or something like that, give him like, a video so he could actually experience the game. That might have been cool, just the idea of someone like the Pope um, experiencing Undertale, like actually getting to experience it. He got to experience it in the terms of just acknowledging it and seeing uh, when he gave him the Steam code for it, but it would just be interesting to uh, actually know that he knows of this story now because video games just get such a bad rap, uh, not just nowadays, but over the years they've always gotten bad raps for uh, causing violence in people or making people violent or antisocial and all that jazz. Really, it's up to us as gamers to uh, 
deny those statements and show how wonderful video games are and how beautiful their stories are and how they bring people together and make them better people. So I thought it was a very beautiful gesture that he gave Undertale to the Pope and I really love the theories that uh, all the Undertale theory videos. The Sands is Nest one, it's cool. I don't think I would have pieced it together when I came in here myself, but it's just cool to think about that like, I have no idea if that was Toby's true intention. If it is, I have no idea. I don't really care. I'm not gonna, con I'm not gonna fault anyone for saying one way or the other. If you just want to believe it for fun, go ahead and do it. As for the other theory, which we will get into in a bit, it is a very interesting. I think that one's a lot more factual, a lot more uh, canon, I guess you could call it. Um, if you haven't watched those videos yet, I very much recommend you do because they retain to things that cannot really be experienced in Undertale without hacking or just being really, really stinking lucky. And it all really doesn't amount to anything. It doesn't really add up or outright tell you anything else that you could possibly know. As far as the game is concerned, you are done experiencing everything in Undertale. But if you keep on trying, if you keep on persisting, trying to find some other answer to what the fruit happened in the end of the genocide run or who the heck Chara is, the game makes it very clear that it doesn't want you to do that because, as I will now show you, anytime you finish Undertale after doing a genocide run, the endings get altered in a way. Allow me to show you. Hey, uh, is anyone there? Well, just calling to say, you made a snowman very happy. Guess I should say something else, too. So, it's been a while. The queen returned, and is now ruling over the underground. She's instated a new policy. All the humans who fall here will be treated not as enemies, but as friends. It's probably for the best, anyway. The human souls the king gathered seem to have disappeared. So, uh, that plan ain't happening anytime soon. But even though people are heartbroken over the king, and things are looking grim for our freedom, the queen's trying her best not to let us give up hope. So, uh, hey, if we're not giving up down here, don't give up wherever you are, okay? Who knows how long it'll take, but we will get out of here. Sans! Who are you talking to? Oh, nobody. What? Nobody? Can I talk to them too? Here, knock yourself out. Wait a second. I recognize this number! Attention, human! I, the Great Papyrus, am now captain of the Royal Guard! It's everything I've ever dreamed of! Except, instead of fighting, we just water flowers. So that's ever so di slightly different. And we're helping Dr. Alphys with her research. She's gonna find a way to get us out of here. Undyne is helping her too. Though, to be honest, her method of helping seems kind of... EXPLOSION-INDUCING! But I think Alphys likes having her around. Uh-oh! Hey, what are you up to, punk? Yeah. Please don't noogle me and you want to noogie the phone! Hey, who's in charge here? Me! Oh, yeah, that's right. I quit my job as leader of the Royal Guard. Actually, since we won't be fighting anymore, the Royal Guard totally disbanded. There's, uh, only one member now. But he's extremely good! Yeah, he is. Come here! PLEASE DON'T NOOGIE THE SKELETON! Anyways, now I'm working as Alphys' lab assistant. We're gonna find a way out of this dump once and for all. Oh, yeah, and I'm a gym teacher at the Queen's School now. Did you know I could bench press seven children? Awesome, right? Hey, I'm sorry about what happened with Asgore. You were just doing what you had to. It's not your fault he... Darn it. I miss the big guy. Come on, Undyne. Snap out of it! 
I guess I'll tell you how Alvis is doing. Well, she's the same as ever. Maybe a little more reclusive than normal. Seems like something's really bothering her. But she can get through it. I'm there supporting her. That's what friends are for, right? Hey, wherever you are, I hope it's better than here. It took a lot of sacrifice for you to get there. So, wherever you are, you have to try to be happy, okay? For our sakes. We'll feel better knowing our trouble was worth it. We're all here with you. Everyone is, even the queen. Hey, wait a second. Toriel, Toriel, do you wanna? <laughs> she says she's busy. But if she knew who we were talking to? We wouldn't get the phone back for at least a few hours. We have the mercy to spare you from her. But call back anytime, okay? She'd love to talk. Oh, whoops. This thing's almost out of batteries. So, hate to cut this short, but... Be seeing ya, okay, buddy? Bye-bye for now! See ya, punk. Why? Why did you let me go? Don't you realize that being nice just makes you get hurt? Look at yourself. You made all these great friends, but now you'll probably never see them again. Not to mention how much they've been set back by you. Hurts, doesn't it? If you had just gone through without caring about anyone, you wouldn't have to feel bad now. So I don't get it. If you really did everything the right way, why did things still end up like this? Why? Is life really that unfair? Say, what if I told you I knew some way to get you a better ending? You'll have to load your save file and... Well, in the meantime, why don't you go see Dr. Alphys? It seems like it could have been better friends. Who knows? Maybe she's got the key to your happiness. See you soon. So as we make our way back to the final area, let me explain just how the game sort of forces you to experience the neutral ending. Because like I was trying to do throughout my playthrough, I tried to get the pacifist ending during my first playthrough, however, I wound up killing one random enemy and Toriel along the way, so that sort of ruined it for me. However, what Flowey does at the end of the fight with Asgore happens no matter what during your first playthrough. It will always happen that way, Flowey will always kill Asgore, and it is Flowey who ruins the pacifist route for you. Even though you didn't kill Asgore, somebody still died. And for that reason, you are forced into the neutral route right at the end. This happens no matter what. Something else that happens is that Alphys doesn't... You never get the prompt to go visit Alphys and uh, do the date thing with her. So that sort of gives you a reason to go back and do that. If you manage to get through the entire game without killing anyone, and the only person who ends up dying is Asgore at the hands of Flowey, then you are able to just uh, restore, uh, restart from your last save point and go to Alphys' house, which allows you to, uh, finish the game, uh, normally in the pacifist ending. However, because I had killed characters by accident during my playthrough, I had to play through the entire game again in, and create a new pacifist ending. Hey, uh, this is Undyne. Shut up, Papyrus. This was your idea. Human, you have to deliver something for me. Uh, please? I'm at Snowden in front of Papyruses. See ya, punk! And after you get that message, you could just restore your save file, and you could go back to Alphys' house, go through the abandoned lab, and, uh, go through the final battle in the pacifist ending. It's a heck of a lot shorter if you manage to not mess up during your first playthrough, but... Honestly, it's not that difficult to just work your way back, and you get to see some cool secrets along the way that build up to 
what everything means in the genocide ending. I don't find it completely necessary to go over every single solitary ending you could get in the neutral route. The phone call you get at the end could be completely different depending on who you did and didn't kill. It's not just a matter of it being neutral. Obviously, if you weren't friends with Undyne, then uh, the ending that I got, originally it was that Undyne has now taken control of the Royal Guard and she is going to find a way to make it to the surface and hunt me down. But since we became friends in this route, she was on the phone call with us telling us to do our best out there. And it could go a lot of different ways depending on how your relationships are with every character. If you decided to kill Papyrus and nobody else, or uh, in my situation, like how I killed Toriel in the beginning, but in this situation she was alive in the end so she took control of the underground as its ruler. But it could be completely different if you keep some characters alive, keep some of them not alive, uh, get close to some of them, don't get close to certain others. It could be something like if you kill everyone except Papyrus, you get a really depressing phone call. Or if you kill only Papyrus, it could be kind of awkward since you get the call from Sans. It's just really stinking weird. There are a lot of different outcomes and it should really just be experienced by you if you want to experience said endings. Or if you just happen to get them during your initial playthrough. However... Chara said that we would have to make a sacrifice if we were ever going to see these characters and this world again. And while it might seem like nothing has really changed, if you went ahead and wanted to play this game again just to experience it, or you wanted to show it to a friend, you may have seen that nothing seems to have changed. It seems like everything has been reset to the way it was. Nothing has changed uh, after Chara gave us our world back. Everything seems just as it was, and you could finally feel better about yourself now that you end the game off on the happiest note possible. Just having all of the characters alive and having the world still here. Now that you know the consequences of the genocide ending, you could simply not play it. However, there is a fourth ending that is only accessible after you do a genocide run. It is referred to as the soulless pacifist ending. They're still here. And they're never going to leave. If you tell Toriel that you have places to go, ah, uh, I see. Well, I hope that I'm not keeping you. Frisk, see you around. There's no escape from what you've done. When Chara said that they would reset the world for us in exchange for our soul, they were not joking. You could play through Undertale over and over again as much as you want. Your experience will be more or less unchanged except for the very last few seconds right before you turn the console off after having saved everybody and gotten the perfect ending that 
you regrettably decided to throw away out of your sheer curiosity of what would happen if you destroyed it all. Chara will be there to remind you of what you did. And they will make sure that you never forget about it. No matter what you do from here on out, if you try resetting the game, deleting your file, it does not matter. Chara will always appear at the end of the pacifist ending. The neutral ending remains unchanged regardless of what you've done because the neutral ending sort of is just a stepping stone that tells you to go into the pacifist ending. So the neutral ending is more or less the same, but as for the pacifist one, it shows that Frisk is no more because of our stupid choices. We had to get rid of Frisk in order to bring this entire world back. And Chara has taken their place. They now live amongst the humans and the monsters. And they could do whatever they want now. So you might be thinking, this must be one final test. The fact that Chara is taunting us at the end of our pacifist run, our second pacifist run, they must want us to go back into genocide so we could finally face them again and actually battle them. And at that point, we will be able to rid this world of Chara once and for all. And we'll finally be able to bring peace to this world. There'll be no more resetting. Once Char is gone, everything will be perfect. Well, I hate to tell you, but that's just wishful thinking. Like I said before, the genocide run exists simply because it exists in the real world. You do have the option and the ability to cause pain and torment within the lives of everyone around you. It's just a matter of whether or not you think it's the right thing to do. There's really nothing to expect once you do it. It's very straight and to the point. If you cause pain, there'll be nothing left. If you kill literally the entire population and destroy the entire world, what are you going to expect to be there for you in the end? Absolutely nothing. The genocide run simply exists. You can do it if you want to, but why would you ever want to? The only answers are either curiosity or you were evil from the beginning. Neither of which are justified. But I'm sure you're still wondering what happens if you do a genocide run after you discover what Chara has done, or rather, what you allowed Chara to do. We did agree after all. But this is the game of infinite possibilities, so of course there's something different in the ending of the genocide run. So if you want to go and do it again, fight Undyne the Undyne and Sans one final time, you will get the final, 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 I'm serious this time, there's nothing else after this, the final ending in Undertale. But before we do that, there's a bit of extra dialogue during the Sans fight if for whatever reason you want to reset the fight after defeating him. If you remember back when we went through the neutral run again, we kept on resetting during that hall, during that meeting in the hall, and 
we were able to prove to him that we were time travelers just like him and we were aware of different realities he used that opportunity to give us the key to his workshop and give us some pieces of information that still to this day don't really have an answer to them however you could still use that power of time manipulation in the genocide run if you kill sans in the genocide run and then reset your game this happens. Hmm. That expression you're wearing. Well, I won't grace it with a description. If you defeat Sans again and reset the game once more, he will say this. From here onward, no matter how many times you reset. That expression you're wearing. You're really kind of a freak, huh? But once you've had your fill, and you move onward, this is the ending. It is known as the Soulless Genocide Run. Greetings, I am Chara. Chara, the demon that comes when people call its name. It doesn't matter when. It doesn't matter where. Time after time, I will appear. And with your help, we will eradicate the enemy and become strong. HP, attack, defense, gold, EXP, love. Every time a number increases, that feeling, that's me, Chara. But you and I are not the same, are we? This soul resonates with a strange feeling. There is a reason you continue to recreate this world. There is a reason you continue to destroy it. You, you are racked with a perverted sentimentality. Hmm, I cannot understand these feelings anymore. Despite this, I feel obligated to suggest, should you choose to create this world once more, another path would be better suited. Now, partner, let us send this world back into the abyss. No? Hmm. This feeling you have. This is what I spoke of. Unfortunately, regarding this... You made your choice long ago! Do you get it? It's the same as what Flowey was doing to us at the end of the neutral run. He simply wanted to kill us more than once because killing us only once wasn't enough to satisfy him. He kept on reloading the save over and over and over again just so he could enjoy the satisfactory of murdering us over and over and over again. We're doing the same exact thing to Sans, trapping him in an endless loop of dying over and over and over again. Simply because we want to. 
No matter what you do, no matter what you try, Chara is never going to disappear. Chara is here to stay because you brought them back simply because you were curious and you will suffer the consequences every time you return to this world. That is the final ending in Undertale. The genocide run simply exists because it can. It is not meant to be played unless you are willing to accept the consequences that come with it. It's meant as just an experience. But you really have to question why you would want to experience such a thing. This game makes sure that you're well aware of what you're doing. And they will never let you forget. You do not have to wait on the screen of nothingness for 10 minutes this time. In the Steam version, your game crashes and it closes the page. Once you reopen it, the game will be reset and you could start the game again anew. In the PS4 version, you wait on the black screen for about 30 seconds and then it will reset on its own. I believe the same is for the Switch version as well, but I haven't played it so I can't confirm. All of these characters and everything that you experienced on this journey do not play the genocide run. Simply be aware of the fact that it exists and accept the fact that it shouldn't be played. Just because something can be done doesn't mean that it should be. It's really incredible and symbolic and something that I have never experienced in any game prior to this. It's absolutely breathtaking what they were able to do. Sans is talking to the player, not the playable character, not Frisk or Chara, but me and you, the one playing. And Chara talks directly to me in the end as well, offering to let me play again if I sell my soul. By that they mean sell my soul to the game by playing it over and over again, thinking that there's something left to find, thinking that we could change something, thinking that we could fight Chara somewhere in some way if we do everything just right. But no, we did everything right before, when we saved the world. We messed up after we had accomplished our mission. We messed up because we were simply bored after we had gotten to the end of our adventure and we wanted to destroy the world just for the sake of entertaining ourselves for a little while longer. But now that we feel bad about this, we try to reset the game, try and make it perfect again, just end the game off on having the completed save file that has a pacifist world in it. The game doesn't let you get away with that. It will never forget that you let Chara loose. If you get to the credits, they will always be there to remind you of what you did. Whenever you finish the game again after doing a genocide route, the game laughs at you for spending the time to do so, because there's really nothing else left for you. They laugh at you for trying, and in a way shame you for playing anything past the pacifist route. I could keep on trying to uncover some sort of truth to it all, but in reality, there isn't any. Genocide exists, and it could be experienced, but there's simply no good reason for killing anyone. It's a life lesson. The game tries to teach you that by having absolutely no point of fulfilling the genocide run. And if I try to make amends with it by playing pacifist again, they'll continue to remind me of what I did while also reminding me that my soul has been sold, aka I've been suckered into playing the game a fourth, fifth, sixth, and possibly an infinite number of times, keeping these characters in an endless limbo for the sake of entertainment. There's no explanation to Chara's resurrection, and there's no way to destroy them or make them good again. 
I released them, and now I have to pay for it. For I have become Chara. Of course I wanted to do every single thing that the game had available to it because it's a let's play and that's what I do here. I know not every game I let's play is a 100% playthrough, but the fact that this was blind, I could not have known what was going to happen if I did everything. But the game succeeded in doing exactly what it wanted to do. It made me fall in love with it during the neutral and pacifist route, and I simply wanted to 100% it. And all that was left for me was the genocide run, and the game shames you for it. And it's well deserved, honestly. If you really, 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 really want Chara gone from your game, the only way you could do it is by deleting the game off of Steam and re-downloading it. Or if you're playing on the PS4 or Switch, delete the save data on the system memory, not within the game itself. If you do that, Chara will disappear, the game will have no recollection of you ever playing it, and you could go to the pacifist ending, and at the very least, let the characters be happy. I can't really say be free of guilt because you'll always remember what you did, but at least you might be able to find solace in making it so they don't have to remember what what you did anymore. Or maybe they do. But at least Char won't be there to ruin it all anymore. At least we hope. So, that's really all there is left to do. There is one final thing. I know I've been saying that a million times, but it's not going to be in another episode. We're going to do it right here and now, and then I'm officially done with Undertale. Remember the credit sequence in the pacifist run? How I thought you had to tap on as many of the names as possible to light them up and see how many you could get? You'd think after playing an entire game that focused around dodging things that are coming after you, I would have gotten the picture that I was not supposed to be touching those things. Yeah, you get a reward if you could get through the entire pacifist credits without touching a single name. It's honestly not the worst thing to do, but it's gonna take a while. If you want to see what the reward is, let's just go ahead and see what lies in store for us beyond the final door. This game was a mistake.